Uh, yeah, because my best attempt at trying to entertain people was to try to come up with a pun, but then I couldn't uh, decide between two different puns, and so then I ended up with a title that doesn't do either of them very well. Uh, and so I, um, uh, so the two puns there, one is because what I want to talk a little bit about today um, is both the parallels between uh, and the, sort of the similarities between PKP and Crossref, uh, but also uh, the, the way at which both organizations are at, a, at an intersection, how we're really coming together. Um, in um, what I think is a pretty critical time in history for both PKP and Crossref. I sort of I think there's uh, good sort of changes ahead and things have evolved to the point where um, the two organizations really have a, a, a lot in common and a lot of ways that we can work together to uh, support our common missions. And so I think it's the right time to really talk about um, what are some of the common goals between PKP and Crossref and some of the com common approaches that I think we take. Um, and the way that these, so the trajectories of both organizations, I think, are coming to an intersection. Um, and so I want to start out by uh, sort of let me see, uh, um, telling you a little bit about what the Public Knowledge Project is. Um, and so since I can sort of safely assume that you know what Crossref is, uh, I'm going to try to explain a little bit what PKP does in terms of something you do know, uh, Crossref. And I uh, sort of want to do that. Uh, and explain because I think while well, PKP has become an important part of, uh, of my own life, having worked with PKP now for close to 10 years, I also can't really imagine the scholarly community without an organization like PKP uh, present. So I want to uh, sort of point out some of these similarities between the, the two organizations. So the first thing is they've actually both been around since the late 1990s, so around since uh, 1999. Uh, PKP started in 1998, you know, one year earlier, but nobody is, uh, nobody's counting. Uh, and both, of their, both organizations had their first sort of made, like product, the first sort of useful thing that they put out into the world uh, in, in 2000, I think. So um, these are uh, both sort of small, mission-driven organizations. Right? Both, uh, um, both uh, share, and I'll talk a little bit more about what is that shared mission and actually the way in which both organizations share a mission as well. Um, they both have distributed teams. So as Crossref is out in the UK and here, uh, PKP is based uh, out of Simon Fraser University in Canada, but also the directors at, uh, we have a strong sort of foothold at Stanford University where PKP's director is, and then our PKP team is actually distributed in different parts of Canada and in different parts of the world. We have members in, uh, sort of team members in Brazil, we have team members in, uh, we had for a while in uh, northern uh, Manitoba, uh, we had in, in the east coast of Canada, and we have someone in Hawaii, we had someone in Hawaii for a while, and so we're kind of, we have team members sort of distributed all over the place, so another commonality that, uh, that we share. We both sort of work at doing what is, might be considered the same thing. We both build uh, infrastructures or key pieces of infrastructure for scholarly publishing activities. And uh, again, I'll talk a lot more about what those, uh, the mission and the way that we both share uh, this kind of infrastructure. And uh, lastly, um, or right, so two more things. One is everyone thinks we're a lot bigger than we actually are. So PKP has only uh, you know, a core part of the team. We're less than 10 people. Uh, Crosser, I think, similarly small, not quite as, uh, as small, but everyone thinks that we are these large organizations because of the things that we've managed to do with such small teams. And I think the fact that we are small teams accomplishing uh, big things and people make this, uh, this mistake is uh, sort of a testament to the work that both organizations are doing. And lastly, uh, the other commonality is that people sort of mistake people from our, uh, our employees for other people. So while PKP's director, John Walensky, often gets mistaken for John Wilbanks, and he gets invited to talks thinking that he's John Wilbanks, and uh, um, you know, cross-chef Jeffrey Builder gets mistaken for Jeffrey Beal. So this is uh, the two differences <laughs> that happen all of the time. Okay. Uh, also, I want to talk about what some of the common assumptions. And so these are um, uh, sort of an increasing, uh, these are sort of uh, stacked in a uh, you know, sort of building off of each other, where I think are common assumptions between both organizations. And I say these things more to explain the assumptions and the, the basis from which PKP works. The first is that I think, sort of we, and I think it's probably an assumption that all of us in this room must uh, share, is that scholarly endeavors are worthwhile pursuits and that there's some benefit to, you know, being part or involved in the scholarly community. Um, that uh, the scholarly communication is an important part of those scholarly endeavors, and that's why we decide to, uh, to work in the area of scholarly communications. Um, that good scholarly communication improves the quality of the scholarship that's done. Right? And so I think that this, uh, that, you know, otherwise why would we be trying to work to improve scholarly communication in, in some sense? Um, that the scholarly record and that what gets, uh, what gets published, what gets, uh, what gets included in 
uh, in the scholarly com in scholarly communications is important, and that we have to preserve that, and that we have to make sure that we're able to look back at that scholarly record over time. That that there's uh, that that's a strong foundation for good scholarly communication. And lastly, that uh, that the infrastructure that can ensure sort of the integrity, the completeness, and the usefulness uh, of of the scholarly record. That it's that that infrastructure that's on at the heart of. Uh, a lot of this communication is, is important to support, and then if we were to go up this list, right, so the infrastructure supports the, um, the integrity of the scholarly record, that that builds on to make better scholarly communication. It's better scholarly communication is, uh, is an important part of all of scholarly activities, and the scholarly activities are worthwhile. Right? And so I think, uh, you know, in short, I think both organizations uh, believe that building on this work is going to somehow have a positive effect on the world, if we can sort of say it in sort of those lofty or sort of uh, very sort of broad, uh, broad terms. And while I, I cannot sort of guarantee that the folks at Crossref think of it this way, and I, I can't even really guarantee that other people at PKP think this way, this is how, I, and I'm probably not doing John Walensky, the director, uh, uh, maybe justice around how he conceives the world that we do, but this is how I understand the role that, uh, that PKP plays and why it is that I've been involved in this, in this kind of work. And I think that the, we... Um, yeah, so this is why, uh, in some senses, it, the, the fact that we believe these things is why I sort of love working for PKP and why I love the work that, uh, that, Crossref, uh, that Crossref does and why I think it's so important. Uh, oh, wait, sorry, my notes here said that I had to compl uh, compliment to Crossref, not that I had to compliment Crossref. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that said, I think both organizations are really working to build. Uh, to, they're very different organizations in many ways, but in, in fact, they really do complement each other. Uh, quite nicely, and that's a little bit what I'm going to continue to talk about in the ways that both of our organizations uh, do uh, complement each other. Um, as I, uh, you know, uh, that said, uh, let me say, uh, yeah, at this point, yeah, sorry, well, those of you that are not really familiar with the work that PKP does are probably uh, either sufficiently confused or sufficiently bored, but so let me go on one more last diversion before I really go into the heart of what PKP, uh, the heart that PKP does, I'll only drag it on a little bit uh, further. <laughs> So I'll leave to Crossref to tell their own story, and I think people here know it very well, but it seems to me uh, that the case for why an organization like Crossref was needed was, is in some sense, fairly obvious, right? There's a lot of people that are, there's a lot of different stakeholders that work in the scholarly community. Uh, there's, uh, there's no one person, no one organization, uh, so no one of those stakeholders could, um, uh, could undertake all of this infrastructure building, all of the activities that need to happen across publishers. And while there's uh, some... Uh, some of those stakeholders that would like to be able to do everything, in some sense, they really benefit from having someone that can cut across all of the different stakeholders and that can speak and work with uh, all of those different stakeholders. I think the scholarly community is best by having uh, uh, an organization that can work, uh, that can provide infrastructure across different stakeholders. And so that case for why Crossref, an organization like Crossref, is needed is, is done. And it's not quite as clear as why an organization like PKP might be needed. So since you are here at the annual meeting. I sort of assume that you know and love uh, Crossref. I'll get back to why it is that we provide the infrastructure that PKP provides. Um, this is, in some sense, why uh, referring to PKP as infrastructure might not be the way that some people think of what the Public Knowledge Project does. Um, but I do think that we provide infrastructure to publishers themselves. And so this might seem a little bit uh, like a counterintuitive notion as you think of an organization like Crossref that is providing infrastructure because they need to work across publishers, how is it that then we can consider an organization like PKP uh, to be infrastructure as well? So this is a um, moment where I finally tell you what PKP does for how long, how far am I into my talk, 15 minutes, but uh, this is uh, probably, if you do know about PKP, it's because you know open journal systems. Uh, so open journal systems is an, uh, an open source. Um, is it? All right. um, it's an open source uh, platform for managing and publishing academic journals. It's a system that can be used to handle submissions, the whole editorial workflow, and eventually the actual publishing and putting the content in a publicly available form. And it's, it's a sort of piece of web-based software uh, that you install and run on some machine of your own choosing, right, on the internet somewhere, and automatically you become a scholarly publisher. This is, uh, there's sort of, there's a few other systems out there in the world that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. You maybe even have, if you're, uh, if you're you know, working with some journal, you're probably using some other platform that is, 
that does all of these things, right, where you sort of an author submission system, a publishing uh, platform. Um, but there's, uh, I'm willing to claim, and this is where I put up this map, that we are probably uh, the most widely used publishing platform out there in the, uh, in the world in terms of the number, the sheer number of journals that are, that are uh, on our one single, one single platform. Uh, and this might be surprising or it might seem weird since I'm also up here saying that you've never, you probably have never heard of us or you only have, you think of us as some a small sort of player in this space. But as you can see, there's uh, over 8,500 journals. So about, this is our last, uh, at our last count, we had over 8,500 journals that were using our software for some part of their process. Now, to be fair, some of those might actually be only using it for receiving the submissions and might not be publishing on the platform. Uh, others out there might <coughs> only be publishing their content, but they're using some other form of a submission system. Uh, but if you're a researcher, uh, I guarantee you, you've come across journals that are using our software. And so if you, this might look familiar. And I cringe every time I, uh, I see this, because this is a very dated uh, sort of interface. But if this kind of uh, journal interface looks familiar to you, uh, it's because you've come across this. And I know I come across it all the time as I'm doing my, my own work, and then I, it's sort of this, you know, this moment of recognition. It's like, hey, I, that's the thing I built, and now I'm you know, benefiting from the journals and the content that's being published um, out there. So this might look familiar if, you know, if we can see some of the other, this is that, that vanilla theme is sort of, you know, we can't stand it, but all of our, a lot of our journals sort of have that, you can kind of tell that it's OJS uh, running underneath. And even the designers still don't completely hide away all of the uh, horribleness of our user interface. But it's, uh, it's, you know, it was in 2003 at the time. There's a reason why it was built in a very uh, old-fashioned kind of look when it was first uh, released. Um, but you know, now it's become dated, and we are going to release a, a, a new sort of updated design sometime in early next year. And I'm not putting a date on that. And I know I can see Jeff and John and other people looking at me around when are we going to do that. But We'll get there. So let me, um, you know, this is, uh, like I said, I'm, um, yeah, I, it's software that's, that's out there. Like I said, over 8,500 journals that are, that are using it for some part of their submission process. And because we are such a widely used system, and as I'm going to go on to talk about who some of our journals are, um, it'll become clear why it is that I consider this piece of software to be infrastructure, whereas I wouldn't necessarily consider other pieces of software out there to be infrastructure, not exactly in, uh, in the same way. Uh, and um, yeah, as I, so I want to say a little bit more about PKP, and you, know, you may have noticed that there's two Ps in PKP, right? So the first one is the public, uh, but the second P is the project part. And it, so it's a little curious that this organization that's putting a submission system out there into the world is doing so uh, as a project. Uh, so this not only betrays the origins of PKP, which was a faculty member's research project at the University of British Columbia, so John Walensky, who's still the current our, sorry, our founder and director, um, but it's not the Public Knowledge Foundation or the Public Knowledge Incorporated or, um, or the Public Knowledge Organization, of which there is a public knowledge uh, that's an organization. We're a project, and I think this is a like I said, a reflection of our past, but it's also the way that we still think of ourselves and the way we think about the work that PKP does. Uh, PKP is, uh, in, in some sense, uh, it's a, still a research project. We're still sort of researching the effects that putting a platform like this uh, out into the world. Uh, so what, what is it that we're researching? Right? And this is, uh, becomes a question around, uh, if we're a project, we're it providing infrastructure, so it's all of these things that might not seem like they belong together, right? It's, we're putting software, but it's a project, but it's, uh, uh, but we do do part of what we do is actual research, and so we have several scholarly inquiry, initi inquiry, sc scholarly inquiry initiatives out there, uh, such as with their different faculty members, such as myself, so I do research around Latin American scholarly communications, I've studied the public uptake of research in Latin America, we have had research projects around the history of intellectual property, and uh, we've had scholarly initiatives around uh, looking at, or right now we have one on uh, looking at the feasibility of doing publishing cooperatives. So we do all kinds of actual like, things that might be more traditionally considered uh, research. Uh, we also have research and development initiatives, such as trying to build software to do automatic markup and XML typesetting. Uh, and uh, sort of building software as uh, experimental software. But 
OJS is having have a trajectory of almost 15 years now, and you being used so widely, is that sense is not experimental software. It's very uh, sort of old-fashioned built uh, software. Because the core of our research and development initiatives as a project is looking at the way in which platforms uh, like Open Journal Systems and Open Monograph Press sort of fit into the scholarly ecosystem. Right? So we're experimenting our, our own. So it lets us ask questions by putting software out into the world, by having that software be adopted at such a large scale. It lets us ask the questions, if there is freely available, uh, a freely available publishing platform, does it lead to greater participation in scholarly publishing? If the cost of managing and publishing a journal can be lowered by providing a platform that allows this kind of uh, automation, does it, lead, does it lead to those savings being passed on to the readers in the form of having free access or having lower cost access? Or put another way, if the cost of managing and publishing a journal can be lowered, would, um, sorry, if, the, uh, if there are tools rather out there that make the management of journals easier at a low cost, does the type of scholarship that gets published uh, what kind of scholarship gets published, and under what model does it get published. And so we're trying to experiment and find out these things by doing what might be considered an intervention. Right? We put the software out into the world, and then we observe to see how it's, how it's being used. There are sort of these questions of if A, right, if this thing exists, then B, what, you know, what B uh, happens. Um, in some sense, this is, you know, not a, uh, it's not a, the kind of, experiment that we can, it's not a controlled experiment, it doesn't, we can't actually say if uh, we put the software on, the, the, is it the cause of whatever happens. But we're, uh, you know, we're in some sense okay with doing that. I did that with my dissertation, actually my dissertation committee was not very pleased that I did that, but I looked at scholarly communication in Latin America where most of the research is published in open access, and I asked the questions, if there is a system in which, a, a, you know, a large region of the world that publishes everything open access, is there a large public use? And I found that there was over 25 percent, or about 25 percent of the use of Latin American came from people that were not, um, that were not themselves uh, affiliated with a university. But I can't say that uh, the fact that open access leads to public use, just like we can't say that you know people using OJS leads to better participation or greater participation. It's not a, it's not a causal kind of, uh, not a causal kind of uh, experiment. So it might. Uh, you know, in that, so in that sense, we're not, uh, we're not really researching this thing, but we're still doing this experiment, and we're happy to observe what happens out in the world when we, when we do this. Um, I think that the... Uh, no, I, sh I should make it clear that although we see this as an experiment, it's not a formal set of questions that we're trying to answer. This is sort of... A, it's the explicit objective that PKP has is to develop a free open source software for conducting research uh, to improve the quality and reach of scholarly publishing. And we do this without feeling really compelled to measure the effect of our software, or just the satisfaction and knowing that in some way that it, is, uh, that it is contributing. And our measure of success is really just seeing the uptake of the software and by putting it out into the world and seeing uh, and letting that community decide how it is that they want to use it. Because we think, like I say, of that a publishing platform is a key, sort of a key building block of scholarly communication infrastructure. So going back to some of those shared assumptions that I shared at the beginning, um, we think that sort of this scholarly uh, infrastructure, people being able to participate in scholarly infrastructure is in some ways making the world a better place. And if we're letting the scholars themselves decide how they, how they want to use this platform, then, um, then we think that we're having a success, even if we're not trying to quantify the effects in any way. Because I think the logic goes uh, something like this, right? But if we think that it's important to, uh, I think it's important for us to go into detail um, as to why it is, how it is that I see PKP doing this. There's, like I said, obviously other providers of publishing systems out there. Um, and then I think we need to, th I, sorry, I'm, uh, this is the jet lag now kicking in. Um, uh, I just, so let me uh, take a, a step back here. And I want to, mentioned that there's some differences between uh, uh, what we do and what other publishers are doing. And same thing, there's some differences between what we're doing and what Crossref is doing, even though we have this shared mission and sort of these shared assumptions. So Crossref's role is around linking, right, and shared infrastructure across publishing. And PKP is suggested, as its name uh, might suggest, to improving uh, and growing the public aspects of research. And so how is it that we fulfill this uh, mission of improving scholarly research and raising the public quality of research? 
our own approach is sort of set out in two, uh, uh, in, in two ways, right? Uh, this is, uh, let me, uh, helps in, sorry, in two ways. By increasing participation in scholarship, both in terms of who is publishing and those who read. Um, sorry, my, my brain is not quite uh, uh, clicking. So, I saw RCS fulfilling the mission uh, in, in two ways. By increasing participation in scholarship, both in terms of who gets to publish and who gets to read, and by facilitating the use of standards and best practices. So, I put in sort of an and the, the simple ways is we help more people onto the infrastructure, and we're helping trying to make that infrastructure better. So in the more nuanced sense, right, we help to increase participation in scholarship, both in terms of those who publish and who gets to read, and two, by facilitating the use of standards and, and best practices. So the way I see it, PKP plays a significant role in increasing participation of who gets to produce research, and we make it possible for almost anybody, even with very little resources, to set up a credible journal with many of those same affordances right, uh, as established, as established uh, publishers. Because the software is free uh, and it can be run on a shoestring it's necessary, uh, if necessary, most journals that use our software are around 83% um, the last time that we checked uh, end up making those journals open access. And so we end up um, having sort of grading participation in who gets to read that scholarship. And, and that in some sense, increases who is allowed to, to participate. So if I go back to this map that I showed earlier, um, where we see the over 8,500 journals that published at least 10 articles in 2014, we can see that there's many uh, of those journals are located in places like Latin America, right, where almost uh, 3,000 journals are using the software. Uh, and it becomes obvious that other parts of the world, like we see uh, participation from Africa, from some parts of, uh, from Asia, and the point is that there's literally sort of hundreds of thousands of articles that are being put online uh, using our software. Uh, notice that there's, uh, and so we see the number of articles that are published. Uh, so you notice that there, there's, there are journals everywhere, sort of, and if you see the presence of the U.S. and Canada is also noticeable. And I focus on the parts of the world where I talk about Latin America and Africa and Asia because uh, these are journal articles that, uh, of places that are normally not present in, the, uh, in large commercial uh, publishers. Uh, and so when we see, if you look at the number of articles being published here, we see that those 8,500 journals published almost 350,000 articles in 2014, um, and, or that article that had a 2014 publication date. And of course, I don't mean to imply that none of these 350,000 articles or wouldn't be online if it wasn't for PKP uh, or if it wasn't for OJS, but I do want to suggest that uh, given that this demographic of where our journals are located, uh, at the very best, none of these uh, are pieces of the scholarly communication of the um, of a scholarly record that would not necessarily be indexed correctly, right? They wouldn't have basic reading tools, basic organization, or, or the high quality metadata that, that is out there. Uh, that is, they would, be, um, they would only tenuously be part of the scholarly record. In these places where journals that would, are, out of these 350,000 articles are published, if they were not being published with some kind of a publishing platform, they would only be tenuously connected to, to the record. And I think that this is the, the role that PKP is playing, and now it's the, the heart of why I consider it to be infrastructure, is because by having these journals participate with a publishing platform, they really actually get to join on to the, to the scholarly record and to the rest of the infrastructure that, uh, that it's out there. And so this is not one of those times when I go on about the exclusion or the underrepresentation of journals in the, uh, from developing countries in international databases, and I won't talk about sort of the built-in biases in the current system or the countless of barriers, some of which are intentional, that uh, prohibit participation from scholars in this part of the world, um, uh, or the uh, sort of the conditions that some of these scholars are trying to publish in. Those are, I, I do those talks sometimes too, and I get very riled up and excited about them. But uh, I don't want to spend too much time talking about these sort of the, the anti-colonial currents of some of the work that PKP does. Because I think in some sense, and it's a real sense, uh, we don't explicitly try to tackle those things. It's not that we put the software out there because we want to, uh, because we're really trying to challenge those things. Uh, we put, uh, there's, these are undercurrents in our work, but I think that it's, uh, understanding, uh, it's an understanding of the consequences of, uh, of inclusivity uh, or the consequences of being excluded uh, in scholarly participation. This is why we try to build participation in scholarly uh, conversations because we, we understand that not participating and not um, having access to this infrastructure can have sort of very dire consequences. And so our approach is simply to try to make the best software that we can 
software that enables anybody that wants to put scholarship out there uh, sort of follow best practices, both in terms of uh, editorial best practices or technical uh, best practices. And we try to reduce the burden uh, that editors have so that they can focus on editing. We try to provide sensible defaults so that those that are less sure about the process can fall back on something reasonable. Uh, and we try to make it easy to follow those best practices both behind the scenes, right, by setting out the right meta tags that uh, get put out there, and on the foreground by, you know, cueing people that are working uh, as editors to remember to thank the reviewers and to write, you know, what, which points they need to communicate. Um, and all these things, we believe, in some sense, lower the burden to actually participating in, in scholarly, uh, in scholarly uh, conversations. Uh, but just as importantly, we sort of try to sort of educate uh, and bring would-be editors up to par. People that are doing these activities but might not have a very good sense of what it is that they should do. And we try to provide the sensible default so that we are helping to do and, and do their job uh, correctly. The hope is that anyone that uses the software ends up communicating and integrating better with the infrastructure than if they had not. And so the reason I say uh, I, have, I don't have to talk about my motivations is and, or uh, are my own sense of place, the place and the role that developing countries need to play in this, is that we don't impose any of these things with our software. We, we don't impose that it should be people in the developing world that needs to use it. And so I know I'm thrilled, you know, as anyone that has heard me talk before, that, you know, I, like I said, almost 80, you know, around 83% of our journals end up being open access. But we're okay with it. 17% that isn't open access. We think that this is, it's important to have uh, uh, all kinds of models and being inclusive of all types of, of scholarship. Um, we, there's several sort of business ventures that are based out on our software, and again, we think that these are great and they're an important part of, uh, is that my time's up? Or? <laughs> um, Um, yeah, so that um, we also, uh, like I said, that there's several business ventures. There's both profit and non-profit activities happening with our software, and uh, this is, uh, and this is, I think, is we think all of this is an important part of a of a good, healthy scholarly ecosystem, right? And so what we want to do is make sure that we have the the other side of that, of those that are not participating in, let's say. Uh, from large commercial, from uh, with a large commercial interest, or in play parts of the world where there isn't any commercial interest in scholarly communication, can also participate. It's all you know, making sure that we have everybody that wants to participate represented. Um, and I do think we need to have publishers working at sort of at all of the different levels. If, if you believe, for example, that we want to have, we you know we want to have very high impact journals, high quality or prestigious journals, uh, we also have to think about how journals can become those things. How do we help a journal get? Um, uh, get up to becoming a prestigious, high-quality journal. Where does it start? What, what's that starting point? And who's allowed, to, uh, who's allowed to do that? If we want journals sort of operating sort of at, you know, at this level up here, then we need to help people that are starting to participate in the scholarly communication from down here find a way of working, uh, working their way up. Uh, similarly, if our interest in having journals be open access, then we need to be willing to accept, accept that there's a transition period, that there might be other models that need to be tried out on the way. And so then people that want to try out those different models need to have the right tools so that they can experiment with whichever models that they think might be suitable. And so PKP, I think what we're trying to do is really try to help fill those gaps between people that are working at different levels, people that are trying, wanting to experiment with different kinds of models, to be able to do that by being able to run a, a free open source platform. And what's most important, we try to make sure that anyone who wants to try to participate in scholarly communications can, uh, can participate. And to be honest, if we were sort of more serious about demonstrating this in the, now in the experimental uh, sense, uh, we would do a better job of tracking who's using our software and how, which we don't. And if I was to tell you the crazy ways by which we arrive at those numbers and the very uh, sort of hacked together process that we have of identifying and I, those journals that are out there, um, you'd sort of laugh that you think that if we wanted to actually know these things, we would actually measure. But our goal has been to... Um, uh, really, just put things out there and let people use it however, um, however that they, however they want. If you've seen, you know the, um, uh, so you, you saw the total number of OJS journals, and here you have the total number of OJS articles, uh, and you know we are trying to, uh, we're, we put these things out there and we try to sort of understand and see what what you know what these things are. So then we go out and look to see who are the journals that are that are using our our software. Let me give you just a. Um, a couple more numbers. In 2009, we did sort of conduct a survey of, of these journals, uh, and uh, we should, 
you know, probably repeat that, that survey now, but if we know that that, um, that survey and from anecdotal experience that the vast majority of these OJS-based journals that are out there are running on a very low budget, right? But more, and more importantly, that the vast majority of these, uh, of these uh, journals are scholar-based journals, or more accurately, group of scholar-based journals. Uh, uh, and so this is uh, now sort of, it's true that many of these journals that are published using OJS are fairly new, Right? And they have not often have the opportunity to establish themselves uh, or achieve the same prestige as other journals that are out there. But we actually, and we actually take a lot of flack for this. So this is PKP because it is mostly very new journals that are using the software and there are a lot of them are running from developing countries and all, most of them are running on sort of shoestring budgets. Uh, and so people have called our journals all kinds of things like bottom feeders, you know, this is, uh, or uh, rinky dink journals. Uh, and I could argue, and, and, and I, I won't, but I, I would argue that this is sort of very misguided, that what we're trying to do is sort of add, you know, making sure that people can participate and have this ladder of being able to climb uh, to becoming high prestige, uh, high prestige, high quality journals. And so we see out there uh, some of our journals, right? So journals from students, right, that are able to use our software. Uh, this uh, journal sort of so being able to set up, journal setting up and running and doing the whole publishing operation because they have access to our software. Uh, the Journals Online project, so there's different journals from different uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, portals sponsored by INASP um, in Bangladesh and Nepal. Uh, there's an African Journals Online, Latin American Journals Online. Again, <laughs> scholars that are uh, being in, under conditions where they wouldn't be able to uh, set up a publishing operation if it wasn't for our software. In Latin America, we see lots of these university-run journal portals. So this is, again, uh, universities in Latin America and in many other parts of the world. This is a journal portal with over 150 journals that are, uh, again, scholar-run, wanting to participate in scholarly uh, communications. And so we see that the academic community's sort of commitment to opening their research and putting their research online uh, is probably the PKP's sort of greatest finding, to be able to see and discover and see how the scholarly community um, out there and scholars themselves want to put their content on there. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, although our goal has, like I said, always been broad, you know, to develop software to improve the quality of scholarly communication, sort of in those very broad, uh, broad terms. Um, uh, but, and regardless of where uh, you stand on the issues of open access versus subscriptions, or whether you agree that scholar publishers, um, you know, are, uh, you know, how widely, how much we value scholar publishers, um, I think what we want to have is a, a means for these people that are wanting to put their scholarship online to have access to the infrastructure. Right? Because if, they, if there is this desire to do this by scholar publishers, by publishers from the developing world, by small journal operations, then we need to give them access to that scholarly uh, infrastructure. Because if we don't, then discover, and this is where I think uh, Martin gave, uh, talked about some of these things yesterday, right? What is, if we don't, discovery will be more uneven, right? It'll further distort the signals that we receive from citations because this scholarship is going to go up there somehow anyway, right? So the signal that we get, we are able to draw from citations because we'll have an incomplete record, right? Uh, metrics won't be tracked correctly, right? Because we won't be able to identify who's doing what. Uh, if we will again, this that would corrupt sort of the indications of people that want to build those tools. Uh, we won't capture the funding information for a you know large. Uh, chunks of what's being put out there. So again, it'll distort the signals on how we, our understanding of how funding is used, and so on and so on, right? Um, and this is where sort of we bring it back to cross-stress mission and that the intersection of the two organizations uh, to improve, uh, you know, we both share this goal of improving scholarly publishing. See, Crossref like PKP is seeking to ensure that all these things happen across publishers, right, and that, uh, and that all take place on a common infrastructure. This is why we celebrate when new members sign on to Crossref because now we know we're capturing another little piece of the scholarly record. And being able to track sort of links across publications, right, making sure that those links persist, keeping track of corrections and retractions, identifying plagiarism, making sort of the database of funding information, tracking social media events, all of these things right, work better if everyone that's publishing scholarly content <laughs> uses common infrastructure. And there's no benefit at all to excluding anyone from participating. Right? It only makes all of these systems uh, worse. And so in our, our, our ideal uh, world, every person that wants to publish scholarly content gets access to this infrastructure. Right? And every single citation right, that, uh, that goes without a DOI is compromising our scholarly record. Right? And it goes counter to both the goals of greater participation that PKP has, and it goes counter to the goals that 
cross our paths of being able to provide this infrastructure across publishers. Um, you notice that if we wanted to edit sort of this, this is, you know, as PKP missions sort of put into very general terms, if we wanted to edit this mission uh, into applied to Crossref, you know, it, there's not so much that we really need to change if we put, if we're looking at the high level, at the sort of at the very high level missions of the two, right? Right? So we, uh, you know, we have in our mission to do it as open source, but it's not that necessarily that that would need to be the case. It's that we manage to achieve our goals better by doing it open source. And we also do research on the side, but other than that, we really have this, uh, this joint mission. Um, and both of our missions, right, both of, for both organizations are sort of best served by having people participate in the use of scholarly infrastructure. It's by having uh, as many as those, of those that want to communicate to do so on the official, right, infrastructure. Uh, and just like Crossref members benefit from each other participating, so too, I think, do the, bene do the members of the scholarly community uh, uh, benefit from having everyone participate on a, on a joint infrastructure. And there's, obviously there's practical concerns to giving everyone access to the infrastructure, right, around the costs and on how we manage these things. But when we look at uh, who's out there, who wants to publish scholarship, right, and when we see the number of small scholar publishers that are out there, uh, and we see that these are coming from a very diverse set of backgrounds, often poorly funded, um, then, uh, it, you know, this points to a need for an, another, that this piece of infrastructure that PKP provides, is provide this tool that allows these people that would be participating somehow to do so and to be able to link up with what the rest of us out there. Um, and so this is where I get to the PKP and Crossref, uh, the love fest, right? Um, if, you know, it's, it, and, it's, and I think it's like in some senses it's, sort of, it's a very beautiful relationship that we've come to uh, harness. And this is where we go from just drawing the parallels between the two organizations and seeing how we uh, come together. Because if, I think by pursuing each our own missions, right, uh, we've reached the point, you know, we've, we've been chugging along in parallel paths where we're both trying to achieve our missions and both, you know, with all of those shared things that I've been talking about. But we reached a point where we also must sort of really acknowledge the mutually beneficial partnership that we've started to actually formalize in the last couple of years. It was sort of a very informal thing. And a few years ago, we've really been trying to make it a little bit more formal. But that is that, so for our journals, uh, using OJS to increase participation, right, for us to meet our goal, they need Crossref services, right? So this is, uh, this is clear, and everyone here that's a publisher knows that you need Crossref services to re fulfill your goals. And OJS journals, likewise, need to Crossref services. Um, this is the only way in which they're going to be fully integrated in a global system of scholarly communication, right? But at the same time, uh, Crossref sort of cross-publisher infrastructure and Crossref mission needs these small operations, right, to be able to participate in Crossref services. So they need a way for making sure that these small publishers can do so. And this is, again, so Martin's uh, talk yesterday where he talked about some of the ways in which uh, some of the difficulties of small publishers to participate um, are important to, to consider because uh, OJS is helping to alleviate some of those, uh, some of those challenges. Uh, and so given that small publishers are our core demographic, it makes sense for us to be working together. Um, and it's true that, you know, not all small publishers don't need to use OJS to participate in Crossref. Um, and of course, we've been making it easier and easier for OJS journals, but we've been, so we're making it easier for OJS journals to, to do so. And so we're trying to help Crossref to bring these people onto the infrastructure, and we're trying to help the journals to be able to, uh, to do so. And, um, and, I'll, and I'll show in a little bit some of you know, the, the extent to which this is already happening. So the reality is that uh, you know, if Crossref is providing the road network, if we think of it as, inf as infrastructure, and if we assume that the small publishers can afford the tolls, which is not an assumption that I, we can make entirely, but if we can assume that they can afford the fees to be able to participate and make the infrastructure successful, uh, we also need to make sure that everyone has some kind of a car to get into. Right? So this is where PKP comes in as infrastructure. If we want to go with the electric grid analogy of infrastructure, if Crossref is the power grid, uh, and, and uh, we agree that we don't want sort of small publishers running cables themselves, right? And we want them to actually join on to the core infrastructure. Uh, then we need to make sure that uh, the small publishers have the right connectors, right? And we need to make sure that we give them the right, the right plugs. Um, and if so, if we you know, if being, because sort of being inclusive is not just about saying, sure, you can use it. We've built the infrastructure and it's open and everyone is welcome. Uh, we also have to make sure that we lower the barriers to being able to access. We make it easy for publishers, for small publishers to, uh, to come in uh, and to have the suitable kind, of, um, uh, suitable kind of plugs, if you will, to be able to do that. Um, 
I want to just sort of close off by saying that, in, in, as, that we've recognized this, this sort of, uh, this love fest, the fact that these two organizations need to come together, and we have started to collaborate because, we, as you know, the number of new publishers that have signed on that are small publishers, and I, so I asked, uh, I asked uh, Carl from Crossref to run me the numbers of how many OJS journals were new members, and I don't know if this is a very a perfect mapping, but so if there's 838 publishers, that, uh, so publishers, not journals, so there's obviously many more journals that are out there that are Crossref members. Uh, of those seven, uh, so I use the APIs, so great that there's good APIs, uh, that I was able to figure out that 727 of those publishers minted um, uh, some kind of uh, DOI with a 2014 date, or they minted, uh, I'm, so I wasn't sure if that was the date minted or the date published date, but it was 727 had a 2014 date. Um, and those published, and this is the number of uh, DOI is minted by OJS members by, by, by year. And so we're seeing an increase of about 600, almost 650,000 uh, publishers with using OJS have minted DOIs uh, as of August of this year. So that's about almost 1% of all DOIs minted, I think, if I, was, if I did the math correctly, so 0.8%. Uh, so, but of, of those, 100,000 of them were just last year alone, and I think that drop in 2015 is just because the year's not, this was done in August and the year wasn't quite, uh, quite up yet. Um, this turns out to be uh, a sort of a growth rate of about 30% since, you know, since you start seeing it around 2008. It's a growth of 30% more DOIs published every, uh, every year for the last uh, five, six years. Um, so for our part, you know, we'll continue to expand on improving OJS offerings of Crossref services, things like automated deposits, uh, things like uh, making sure that we can um, uh, have, provide the richest metadata which is, uh, uh, that we can from what we're able to collect. Uh, and as we sign, uh, continue to sign uh, sort of more Crossref members through our new sponsoring entity agreement that we have where we are able to help to lower some of those burns of access, uh, and we'll build sort of future integrations with Crossmark, fun, uh, well, uh, oh, what's that? it's not Fundref now, it's fun, Funder Data, uh, and the upcoming DT, which will also get a new name, I hope, <laughs> uh, and the upcoming DC. We'll continue to do all those things, right? Uh, so, um, but, you know, as we continue to do that, let me suggest that if you believe in the importance of good metadata and persisting linking, and the benefits of having a shared infrastructure, and if you don't, you probably should not be in this room if you don't believe in those things. Uh, you already support the core of what PKP does. Like, if you believe those things that are the core things that, PK, that Crossref uh, does, you also, we, you share all the same values in our shared mission that PKP does. And the fact that we, as we discovered that there's incredible interest from the scholarly community to publish their own work out there, um, is a demonstration that these kind of journals will become an increasing part of the scholarly communication uh, ecosystem. And so we need to think about the role that they, they play. That 30% growth rate of just people that are actually participating in Crossref is not a, it's not a negligible number, right? And as it, it's gonna continue to grow and become increasingly more and more part of the record. And so I just wanna close off by saying sort of a last couple of words about inclusivity, right? Um, helping people to participate in scholarship can only be a good thing, right? It is a good thing uh, for scholarship itself, especially if we provide the right tools that help make that participation possible. The right discovery, uh, like if we, you know, if we put the right discovery and filtering mechanisms out there, more people participating can only, can only help. Uh, being inclusive helps us towards our goal of improving, uh, our goal of making the, uh, improving the public quality of research, but it also helps in cross traps or persistently link across uh, the scholarly record and it helps to improve the, uh, the integrity of the scholarly record. So if you build infrastructure or you support an organization such as Crossref that builds infrastructure, uh, we just need to remember that there's a, a wide range of scholarly endeavors out there um, and that people are wanting to participate. And they all just sort of deserve the same systems uh, uh, and the access to the sort of support that is suitable for their needs and how it is that they need to participate. Thanks. Do I have time for a couple questions or? Yeah, sure. Yes. During the, business, <clears throat> during the business meeting this morning, we saw how important strong financial infrastructure is to support a public infrastructure. How does PKP finance its operations? Well, uh, with difficulty would be the short answer, but the, 
the longer answers we rely on uh, we we this we have this problem of sustainability we have as uh, we have sponsored uh, organizations that were primarily research libraries in North America that uh, that sponsor PKP and that uh, give us sort of an annual uh, sponsorship amount. We also have uh, sort of cost recovery services, like we provide hosting uh, services, um, and so we have P so our PKP uh, publishing services uh, arm, um, and we rely a lot on research grants to, and so that's being still a research project. We, um, as faculty members like myself and John, will go out and seek research that uh, research funds that tie into PKP activities, and we fund PKP in this way. But we are chronically underfunded or constantly in the struggle of uh, making sure that we've been we can survive we've been doing that for 15 years so it's we have a track a track record of of doing that successfully but it's um uh, but it's with difficulty and it it compromises the ability of us to do our work well because we're not quite sure where um where our next meal is coming from on um it's uh, Jeffrey Beal mm -hmm. over here. <laughs> um, so uh, w one problem I think that both of us face, and I, this, I swear this isn't a setup question. I don't know what your answer is going to be, but um, the uh, is actually we have a lot of people using our infrastructure, um, but it's not exactly clear that um, they are knowing why they're using the infrastructure. They want to communicate, but they don't have a lot of background in the, the you know in the in the process, in the expectations of scholarly communication, and so on and so forth. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, so there, so for instance, with Crossref, there's a lot of sort of cargo cult thought around, we need the DOI, and it's not exactly sure why they need the DOI, they just know they need one. Um, what do you see as the role of PGP, Crossref, or other organizations in helping to um, educate these new publishers without sort of also stifling them and forcing them into, you know, uh, sort of patterns that uh, might not be appropriate to, to their publication uh, agenda. Yeah, and so we we take we do have an uh, an active you know role in trying to educate publishers. So we try to do this uh, through our software. So this is kind of our this is the the subversive approach to educating people is trying to make tools that prompt them to do the right thing. You know, the quote unquote right thing. And so around um, having metadata and what you know the, we think that it's good for people to understand the importance of high quality metadata, but while they are coming to terms with understanding that, we should be providing interfaces and providing tools that make it so that even if they don't know why they should be doing it, the system is guiding them towards putting in what are the, the, you know, the required fields of metadata, what should go into those fields, and making sure that then those fields get, um, you know, get attached to their DOIs and people are not just minting the DOI with nothing but the title. Right, or the journal, whatever the minimum required is, we try to prompt people to do more. I think that we can do a lot through software systems to change the culture or change the habits that people have and teach them best practices without having to do an explicit education campaign saying this is why these things are important. Although there is an element, there's, you know, there, that's the basic of what we try to do, and then there is an element of actually providing education around you know, why those things are important so that people put more care and thought into them and figuring out mechanisms for, for how to do that. And we've run workshop series and other things like that, but uh, we think that the software itself at least plays some role in doing that education, or we try to offload part of it to, to the software and then try to do the explicit uh, education uh, in that through, through, through other channels. And we have our PKP school initiative that teaches editors sort of best practices and so on. Um, because I do think it's important for people to understand, but in the meantime, we want everyone, even if they don't understand, to, to be able to participate. And this is where I think we really come in with the small publishers who don't have, haven't learned all those things yet, and we're guiding them to at least doing the best practice without, even if they don't know that they're doing it. Okay. Sorry. Uh, one last question. Yeah. Um, given that you have the, uh, this common shared infrastructure, is there like a shared API across these systems that would let you sort of aggregate data across different journals or something like that? Yeah, so well, we have an, all of our, the OJS journals have uh, the OAI PMH uh, interface that lets us harvest. This is actually how we end up counting the number of articles that are published using OJS that we, we know that is because we identify the endpoints and then we go out and harvest them. And we've started actually a, an indexing, a sort of a, a very lightweight indexing service, which is basically just a, a, a harvester, an installation of our own harvesting software that's touching across all of these. Um, so it, so that those kinds of things are possible by having it out there, but it's been a big part of what we do to keep 
keep things distributed and to give to give away our software, making sure people run it in whatever way they want from their own institutions. Uh, and there's lots of sort of other reasons why we so we have philosophically we think that that's important, but I also think that it, it ties into what I'm saying around making sure people can use the software for whatever they want um, uh, out there. And so we don't want to have that centralized control, but we put in the interfaces and the metadata sharing so that we can aggregate and people have, there's people that are built sort of services around discovery that, uh, that you know, use those, uh, those endpoints. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.